Hello and happy Teach Me Tuesday. My name is Lisa. I'm a NICU nurse and a NICU nurse educator here with another topic broken down for you in hopefully less than 20 minutes to have you get on your day with another teaching topic. Today we are going to talk about congenital diaphragmatic hernia because this week, like during throughout this week, we have two kind of like day ofs, and that is April 19th, which is congenital diaphragmatic hernia awareness day. And then in April 20th is HIE awareness day. So we are gonna just put those into two Teach Me Tuesdays. And since the 19th comes before the 20th, today we are talking about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia, right? It is rare but serious condition that affects every one in 2,500 to 3,000 lives births. So CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, not to be confused with CHDs, which are congenital heart defects, but CDH, probably what I'm going to be saying the rest of this, so I just want to kind of get that grind in you. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia, CDH. But what this is, is there's a herniation or a hole or a space in the diaphragm. So your diaphragm, you know, is this big muscle that goes across underneath your ribs. And kind of depending on where this hole is, depends on what kind of CDH you have. We are going to talk extensively about one kind, a little bit about one, and I'm going to mention a third, just so you kind of know what they are, but we're going to primarily talk about the big one. But the most common complication is pulmonary hypoplasia, and that is because the contents of the abdomen, which are supposed to be down below the diaphragm, come up into the chest cavity, and then you can't grow your little lungs, and so you have pulmonary hyperplasia. So depending on how big the hole is, how much of the stomach contents came up, and what the repair is going to look like is kind of depends on how the baby's going to do. So that's all going to depend on what the baby does. And to figure out, hey, what is going on with the baby and how is this diagnosed, we can have two kinds of diagnosis, antenatal, is pretty much the most common, especially for severe CDHs, right? It's usually on that 20-week ultrasound. I remember being at my ultrasounds as a uh, birthing mother and just thinking to myself, like, oh, my gosh, please, like, let everything be in the right place. And this is one of those things. So often you're also going to see a shift. You're going to see that stomach or liver in the chest. So there'll be some polyhydramnios. There can be an MRI done. However, sometimes these are not caught antenatally, especially if they are very small. So the baby would be born with a scaphoid abdomen, decreased breast sounds, and asymmetric chest. So something to think about there. So we ask ourselves, what causes this? What happens when that diaphragm muscle separates in the chest and the abdomen? It doesn't close completely, right? It's open when the baby's developing and it has to close. So instead, these stomach contents are coming up in there. We don't know specifically why. Of course, I've talked about this before. We like don't know that much about our genetic code. I know we know a lot, but like we don't actually know that much. I read where, somewhere once, I wish I could remember the statistic, but like if you laid out your genetic code like gene by gene, it like could go around the earth three times or something, and that's probably not right, but it was something crazy like that. So there could be a genetic factor in there that we just don't know yet. Something can be happening with the environment, toxins we're exposed to, et cetera, or it can be a combination. But in this little picture with mild CHD, you can see that there is just a little bit of stomach, a little bit of intestines up in the lung, and the where the lung cavity on the left side. And so that's what's going on here. So have you guys ever used Google Translate to like, not Google Translate, Google pronunciation to help you like understand how to say something? That's what I was trying to do because I cannot say this word. And so we're just going to talk about the most common type, but bach, bach delek, bach delek. I saw it in both ways. Hernia, which we all assume is named after someone, is the most common type. This is primarily what you're seeing when someone says, oh my gosh, we're getting a CDH. This is what you're seeing. It's 70 to 90%, depending on where you get your statistics. It's in the postlateral diaphragm. Most commonly, they are left-sided, which means that the stomach, right? The stomach comes up in that diaph uh, via that diaphragm hole. The intestines, the more that's up there, the smaller that that left lung is going to be because it hasn't been allowed to grow. So there's just been no room for it. It causes that medial stinal shift. And if it's on the right side, which it could be, the liver, if the liver is all the way up in the chest, is actually often when the babies do the worst. This is most likely caught prenatally. So just keep that in mind. Like 
it's unlikely, but it can happen. And we're going to talk about this when we get to another slide about NRP. But just know, when there's a lot of contents up there, if there's prenatal care with ultrasounds going on, very common to be caught there. So how do they treat it? So this and this co most common type, especially when it's on the left side, it's likely treated with a patch. I have some pictures here for you. Sometimes they can just sew the whole clothes and bring the stomach contents down, which again, mind blowing that this is what we figured out. But the baby's born, we don't want to get, do any sort of PPV bag mask if we can avoid it because we're going to make the stomach bigger, the intestines bigger. It's going to put more pressure on the heart and lungs, right? Because they're up in that chest cavity. We don't want them in there. We need to get a Repogol in, a sump pump, so we can get decompression going. The infant has to be stable before they can go to surgery. For some babies, that could just be the same day. Some baby could take a few weeks, especially if they end up on ECMO. Um, we use INO, sildenafil, or ECMO, especially for babies with severe pulmonary hypertension. And then they have this reduction of the organs, we close up the diaphragm, we either stitch it close or we put a patch in. And then the baby is great. Well, there are going to be some comorbidities and they can't outgrow their patch, but we're going to talk about some of that. But that's how this is treated. Again, this is the most common and the more organs from the stomach area up in the chest cavity, the worse the baby is going to do. It's also fascinating because they do fetal surgery now where they go in while the baby is still in utero and they actually place something into the esophagus so that it doesn't fill with fluid and air and so then the intestines are smaller and so that that lung can grow which is fascinating they do that at a hospital near me so I was reading all about it so morgogni hernia is the other most common Again, it's only two to 5% of cases. I've seen this twice kind of recently, once in a baby, and that was during kind of the baby wasn't doing great. They were trying to figure out the baby had neck, and so they were getting extra tests, extra ultrasounds, and they saw a right-sided uh, CDH, and it was just a little one, and so they were actually, it wasn't affecting the lung growth or anything, so we did not do surgery on it. And I have a friend who got diagnosed with this in adulthood, um, was kind of having almost like severe reflux symptoms to the point where maybe they thought they were having a heart attack and they did some testing and they had this hernia. So um, sometimes we don't know that it's there. It doesn't really cause any sort of severe pulmonary compromise. You can watch for that. You can often see it on imaging as I'm describing. There could be surgical intervention if needed, but this is really minor. It's way less of a big deal than the most common one that we just talked about. So just things to keep in mind, if you're looking at this picture, what the third one I said I was going to mention is the central hernia, and that is the most uncommon. And again, it depends on the size and what the uh, stomach contents are doing. But you have to think about the diaphragm and kind of where it is and what the shape of this muscle is. It goes from the front of you to the back of you and the way it's separating your lungs from your stomach contents. And so with the Bakhtelec hernia, the most common one, you're typically, right, we talked about seeing it posterior. And so that's kind of why the intestines and the stomach are coming up in there. With the Morgani, it's usually anterior, close to your sternum, which is sometimes why you're seeing that liver come up there, right? And then the central is more kind of in the middle of your diaphragm um, under there. So just things to think about. Uh, I do want to focus on the Bakhtelec and the, being the most common, kind of what we're seeing. And when we see those really sick CDHs, this is what we're talking about. So again, let's kind of go back to that most common. So we're going to talk about resuscitation. We just spent two weeks talking extensively about NRP. And one thing we didn't talk about is kind of special circumstances. And this would be one of them. So if you have a known severe CDH, you're going to have a pre-brief with the team. We're going to be talking about how we're not doing PPV. We're going to be talking about getting that baby intubated, having all of our intubation supplies ready to go so that we have different ET tubes maybe if we need it, um, different style. It's just like everything going ready for us depending on what's happening. Uh, an OG tube, even if we don't have lower intermittent suction in the delivery, you can get that OG in and start doing manual decompression of the abdomen. 
And then when the baby's obviously admitted, we don't want to be doing any high pressure ventilation. So maybe jet, oscillator. I typically see oscillators in a setting where we have both. So immediately after birth, you might see some of this respiratory distress cyanosis. If it's unknown, you could see that scaphoid sunken abdomen, which you see in this picture with that barrel shaped chest. You will hear heart sounds in a different place, and then you might hear, uh, oh my gosh, you might hear bowel sounds in an unusual place. And so that's something that we're looking for if we see this barrel shaped chest with a scaphoid sunken abdomen. We're listening, the heart's not quite in the right place, and we're hearing bowel tones in another, that's when we would suspect, oh my gosh, we have a CDH and we didn't know. So obviously, if it is severe CDH, we're going to see severe respiratory distress. This year, right in January, we also talked about NICU admissions. So just something I wanted to touch back on is we're going to have that immediate intubation to avoid PPV, bag mask ventilation. Again, remember, if you are not giving PPV through an ET tube and you're using a mask, we can't direct that just to the lungs. So a portion of that is going to go into the esophagus, which goes into the stomach and into the intestines. If you're making stomach and intense intestines bigger and your stomach and your intestines are in your chest cavity, you're going to have even further compromise of your cardiac and pulmonary function. And that's why we're not doing it. Having your apogal set up, having enough suction canisters and um, on the wall manometers so that we can get this going, that's going to be that low intermittent suction where it goes on, off, on, off. We're going to get vascular access right away, have your central line team ready to go. If the baby has a severe, you're probably going to be putting in a UA and a UV, probably a dual lumen UV. I did not use dual lumens until my last center. And let me tell you, I have on the dual lumen train. I am into them. I believe in them. They're amazing. We're going to get some labs. We're going to get an x-ray, have that gentle ventilation that we talked about, probably an oscillator, watch for pulmonary hypertension some sedation if needed, and then INO or ECMO for severe. So let's talk a little bit about what could be going on. Why is it severe? So two reasons that we may end up on ECMO. One is if we have pulmonary hypoplasia, and that's because so much of the abdominal contents have come into the chest cavity that the lungs have not had room to grow. If the lungs aren't working, you can understand that we would be in a place where we're not exchanging gases, and then we would need something like ECMO. PPHN, remember, is when that there is not a transition from intrauterine to extrauterine um, blood flow and pulmonary pressures. And so the pulmonary pressures in the lungs are not dropping, therefore, the gases aren't exchanging. And so in those two situations, you're likely going to need kind of that severe, maybe just INO or sildenafil or going on ECMO. Long term, these babies could have feeding difficulties, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, neurological development delays, especially with severe, especially if they've had surgery or any respiratory and cardiopulmonary compromise. Remember perfusion. If you have poor perfusion, especially for a prolonged period of time, that's when we have issues with our uh, neurodevelopment. They're at risk of chronic lung disease, especially in the setting of severe hypoplasia, and then there might be comorbidities with cardiac anomalies. Long-term outcomes, just follow all of those things, home oxygen, feeding tubes, pulmonary nutritional support. They may be slow feeders. They might need pulmonary and GI follow-up. There's risk of re herniation after the surgical repair. Right patches may not hold forever, so just something to think about there. And then what do we need to be telling our parents? We need to talk about what this diaphragmatic defect is, how it's affecting the lungs. Like I've just said, the more of the abdominal contents that are in the chest cavity, the less the lungs can function and grow. So we need to talk about what the NICU course is going to look like, when the baby's going to need surgery, talk about pulmonary and cardiac status, prepare for ECMO, get them involved with some support groups, get them connected with the social worker, talk about discharge needs and what multidisciplinary care is going to look like. So CDH is a rare but serious medical condition. Whenever we have severe CDH, I do always kind of get like a little tingly, like a little nervous, like, okay, what's going to happen? How well is the baby going to do? When can we get surgery going? 
Um, and there can just be a lot going on with that. So a stabilization at birth, right? NRP. Remember, I've talked so much about PPV. This is a situation where we're not going to do PPV until we get the baby intubated. Surgical repairs, individualized. It can be delayed. We need to make sure the baby is in a safe place before we do that surgery. And then how can we support our families? So this week, Saturday, April 19th, is Congenital Diaphragmatic Hernia Awareness Day. So I hope this has brought a little light for you, a little shine on CDH, and maybe helped you prepare. Hey, I'm going to get this admission. What should I have ready to go? I'm going to go to this resuscitation. What should I anticipate? Or I'm going to be taking care of this sick baby. Why are they on INO? Why are they on sildenafil, right? Those are medications that are going to be helping with our persistent pulmonary hypertension, our PPHN. And we have done a previous Teach Me Tuesday on that, so I encourage you to go back and look into those. Have a great Tuesday. I will see you next week for another tiny NICU topic broken down just for you. Have a great day.